have a few quick announcements. We're taking a break from programming ahead of spring break, but we'll return on Tuesday, March 19th with Representative Joe Kennedy III, and that will be at Wallace Annenberg Hall at 3 p.m., not at our normal 5 p.m. time, but at 3 p.m. Our Climate Forward Conference is coming up on Thursday, April 4th. John Kerry will be keynoting at Bovard Auditorium, followed by a full day of panels at Town & Gown. Admission is free for students. In addition, undergraduate students of any major are invited to apply to become a student delegate for the conference. Student delegates will have priority seating, and they'll also attend an all-expense-paid post-conference retreat at the USC Wrigley Marine Science Center on Catalina Island on April 5th and 6th. Uh, um, tonight's conversation is being broadcast again on Facebook Live, and I'm delighted to have it with Jane Jun, my colleague, Professor of Political Science and Gender Studies at USC Dornsife, the author of five books on political participation and public opinion, and currently at work on a new book on the gender gap and voting in the United States. I will probably get in trouble for the last thing I'm going to say about her. Tomorrow she will be installed in the USC Associate's Chair in Social Sciences. It will be a nice ceremony, but I don't think she gets any more money for having a chair. Uh, Adam Nagurney, uh, the Los Angeles Bureau Chief for the New York Times since 2010, formerly the Chief National Political Correspondent for the Times, covering the 2004 and 2008 presidential elections, and before that, covering every presidential election, I believe, Adam, since 1988. 1888. <laughs> uh, he is currently writing the sequel to The Kingdom and the Power, the classic history of the New York Times until the 1960s. So he's a lot of ground to cover, about half a century's worth. Uh, Stephanie Cutter, uh, a CNN political commentator, regularly appearing across the network's programming and political coverage. She was the deputy campaign manager for Barack Obama's 2012 re-election campaign. She's a founder and partner at Precision Strategies, a strategic consulting firm launched with three veterans from the Obama campaign team. And she and I worked together on some pretty interesting and uh, tough endeavors uh, uh, when I was in an earlier incarnation. Okay, guys, we're here to discuss the democratic field in 2020. And we could spend hours discussing each candidate's strengths and weaknesses because there are now so many candidates. So first, let's examine this from a bird's eye view. What will it take to get a Democrat elected in 2020, and will the sheer number of candidates in the race make it difficult for Democrats to beat Trump? Stephanie, you want to start off? Well, uh, what is it going to take for a Democrat to uh, win the nomination and then ultimately beat Trump? Um, you know, I, I don't think we know yet, but I can tell you some of the things that we're starting to see. Um, you know, there are how many, how many of announced so far, eight, six or seven. There's at least another up to 10 or 12 um, about to announce. I think we're going to see some governors come out towards the end of the week. Um, uh, I think Joe Biden <laughs> is, uh, is close to be making an announcement soon. Um, you know, the kinds of things that these candidates are trying to do now is establish their lane in this very popular primary. Um, and, you, you know, Amy Klobuchar right now is the moderate voice um, in the primary. Uh, Bernie Sanders uh, just came out. He is the, 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 le the left of the left wing um, of the primary process. Everybody else is sort of in between. And I think people are trying to establish their lane, who they, they can appeal to in primaries, whether they can, uh, you know, light that match. Um, and uh, and ignite something. And right now, it is it is so early. As, as we feel like we've been living this uh, for a long time since Trump was elected. Many of us have been trying to plot how to uh, win back the White House. But uh, in terms of presidential cycles, this is a very early part of the primary process where voters are just shopping around, taking a look. Even the candidates are trying to work out how they're going to run. What, what's their stump speech? What's their opening argument? What's their closing argument? And the, the race is not going to uh, really shape and form probably until June when they ha stand on the stage together in their first debates. That's the first moment that pe uh, voters can really compare. Um, uh, these candidates to each other and start shaping some opinions. Um, I do think the number of people in this race 
Um, it complicates it in that it's hard to focus the argument solely on Donald Trump. Um, as much as Democrats are saying now that they aren't, uh, you know, combating each other, funding each other, this is a competitive process. And if it's a competitive process, uh, in order for you to win, you have to knock somebody else out. So uh, that, just by the nature of these things, means that somebody, uh, there's, there'll be some attacks. Uh, that takes the focus away from Trump. Uh, it also dilutes uh, the, the money Democrats are organizing, the staff planning for uh, the general election, all of that um, gives an advantage to Trump in, um, in this cycle. It, same advantage that any other incumbent had. We had it in 2012. Uh, George Bush had it in 2004. Um, but the sheer number of candidates means that it's just that much more difficult. Adam? Um, first of all, thanks for having me here. Um, a couple of thoughts on this. Let me start with where Stephanie left off. Um, over the years, I think we've all sort of wondered and debated about whether or not it's bad for either party to have a crowded competitive primary. And I, I think I've written stories arguing both sides of it. Um, but I do think, after all this time, I do think it's better for a party because what it does is it trains candidates in how to run for office and how to deal with the tax and how to frame their arguments, what they stand for. Um, how to present what they stand for. And I think that's more important than ever when you're running against a candidate like – a president like Donald Trump and when you have so many candidates in the field now who don't have that much experience. Um, so I do think it's probably a good thing that there are so many people. and It's n n not, not a bad thing. And it's going to be a bloody kind of period as they fight with each other inevitably um, and Democrats will be tis tis ticking, tisking – candidates who attack other candidates. But at the end, somebody's going to emerge, and I think you'll see the party um, rallying around, whoever it is. Um, in terms of whether or not uh, how easy or what it takes to beat Donald Trump, I I'm one of those people who have long thought since election night um, that Trump is more vulnerable than some people suggest. Um, I mean, I think he won that election. He won fair and square, but I think he won it in a very kind of Everything broke his way. I mean, he won – I forget the exact numbers, but he won four states by 60,000 votes. He was running against probably the um, – I'm going to get in trouble for this – the one candidate that he could beat. Um, and I think that she – Senator Clinton – Secretary Clinton ran a problematic campaign in terms of um, not putting resources into the states that turned out to be the key states. Um, the amount of opposition to Trump – the intensity of it is more than I can remember against the sitting president, maybe since Johnson um, in uh, 1968, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, and I think that we saw it in the midterm elections now. We saw it right here in California. There's a reason why you saw seven Republicans get knocked out in Orange County and other parts of the state that tended to be Republican. I think a lot of that shows how intense Democratic voters are, and I think they're going to turn out. And the last, uh, the last thing I'll say is to me the key question in this election is whether Democratic primary voters end up going after – going for somebody who they think has the best chance of beating Donald Trump, and we can talk about who we think that is later, um, or whether they're going to go with their hearts and go for the person that most sort of expresses how they feel, whether it's on – Health care or impeachment or – I guess impeachment doesn't matter as much when you're running, but yeah. <laughs> Jane, what's your take on this? Well, others have said a lot of important and interesting things. I think um, I'm just going to make a couple of points. One, we don't want to – we have to use the past to better understand what's forward in the future. And at the same time, what's coming in the future is, of course, dynamics. So Adam just pointed to the recent uh, significant wins, close wins, but nevertheless significant wins – among Democratic candidates for the House of Representatives in Los Angeles County. And again, I believe it is the case that there are no more Republicans representing Los Angeles County or even Orange County. Is that correct? Right. And so therefore, what I would point to is a couple of things. Number one, you know, all of these primaries are won at the state level. Each one of those states are their own electorates. And within the context of the primary elections, of course, it's a very different type of an electorate than would be in a general election. So if we're forecasting and thinking going forward, what plays in Iowa is not the same thing that plays in California or other states. So as we analyze going forward, as you think about analyzing this going, for, analyzing this 
going forward, you have to be very mindful of the fact that it's not all occurring on the same day, Election Day, November 4th. These will be occurring in a serial sequence, and therefore the dynamics of that race will vary as a function of, in particular, the locations where candidates gain their momentum early. I mean, I'm not telling you something that you don't already know. What I would point to, however, as something that could be distinctive in this period is precisely what we saw in the 18 midterms, and that is extremely high voter turnout among people of your generation. So people of your generation are also much more diverse racially and ethnically, and that creates a very different set of voters for uh, Democratic candidates in a high turnout, high interest election, which 2020 will be. So I think looking forward and just building off of what my co-panelists have said, what I think we're going to see is an election and a race in the primaries that will be unlike, uh, very different from what it was in 2016. And I think much more dy dynamic, much more interesting, and probably also driven a bit to the left. I think we can probably all agree that that's what the candidate, uh, the successful candidates will look like. Uh, I want to get back to that in a minute, but I want to do a follow-up on uh, what Stephanie said about the race will begin to form in June when we have the first DNC sanctioned debates. As I understand it, the DNC is thinking of breaking the process into two debates. So if there are 20 candidates, you'll have 10 candidates on the stage one night, 10 candidates on the stage the second night. People will debate which debate you should be in because maybe one will have the first one will have higher ratings. But if you think of these as 90-minute debates, if you have 10 candidates, you have people asking questions, that means each candidate gets about six minutes of time in the debate. Uh, so I'll start with Adam. Are, are debates broken as a mechanism for, for doing primaries? Um, I, the general answer to your question is no, they're not broken. Um, but I do agree with you with this many people. I don't see what kind of impact they're going to have. Um, it's hard to break through. It's hard to figure out how you're going to judge them, but I can't sit here and give you an alternative. I think debates are a good thing. I think candidates should participate in them. I think they're good for voters. I think they're good for candidates. I don't know what the answer is to the Democratic Party with dealing, in dealing with such a big field. So I, 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 don't, I don't mean to sort of hedge on this, but I don't see what the repair is for a process that is not working. I think it's just a matter of too many people. Jane? I, I don't want to say that debates are an anachronism, but there's something of an anachronism in the current environment that we have. You can look at any of your candidates, by that something that's old-fashioned or that we, we like to rely on something that we thought has always been there, like the bread box. Who has a bread box in their house? Anybody? You're like, what's a bread box, right? <laughs> it's a bit of an anachronism, question. isn't it? So in this sense, um, there are multiple and many other ways in which debates could take place, exchanges between candidates not in the same format that we have. I think we're right at the, at the time at which that's probably going to happen. So it's not to say that the question is um, not uh, a relevant one. It's certainly a relevant one if we view the process of candidate selection as we have before prior to really everybody being able to look at anything at any minute of the day. So I don't know about you, but... The, the, the entity that I spend most of my time looking into is not my husband's eyes, it's my phone, right? So all, every, what's the first thing you look at when you wake up in the morning? Not the person you're lying next to in bed. Sorry, honey, it's your phone, right? So any time you want to see anything about somebody, you could have two candidates deciding they're going to face off and talk uh, absent the, um, the uh, Democratic Party's organization. So I do think that we're at the forefront for other modes in which candidates can in exchange with one another in addition to the traditional debate format. But quickly, as, as voters, I think you want to have a situation where voters can compare candidates one-on-one -on -one or one-on-10 in terms of what they're like, how much they have a command of issues, what they're talking about. I, d I do think they serve a valuable purpose. And I don't look at my phone first in the morning, <laughs> just for the record. Well, you know, Trump Second. actually mastered this right. format. It's right. Stephanie. Right. I think that they are a tool. They are not a perfect tool, uh, and they're not the only tool, but they are one tool through uh, an electoral process through which voters get a lens of what these people are made of. And Trump, you know, as Bob had started to say, Trump completely mastered how to get attention in a very crowded field. Remember, the Republican primary at this point 
four years ago was just about as big um, and growing at this point. And they had to do the two-stage debates. Theirs was varsity, junior varsity. The DNC is taking a different approach and randomly assigning people to different nights, at least for the two first debates. Um, you know, I think that the idea of debates is also to, of national debates, is you know, these candidates are going to be spending every minute they can handle uh, that they, if they're not serving in the House or Senate, that they can break free to get to one of the early primary states. So the people in early primary states get to know these, these candidates very uh, personally, up close. I can't tell you, Bob, how many chili, firehouse chili ch side <laughs> chats did we have in uh, 2008, I mean 2004, going through New Hampshire and Iowa. Um, and so it's, it's not necessarily targeted at the voters in these early primary states, but voters across the country who really don't get to see these candidates that much until we get into a general election setting. So I think they're a tool. You know, I think that uh, a candidate is wise uh, to think about how they're going to differentiate themselves and, not, in, and uh, not speak in talking points or platitudes, but figure out how they're going to personally connect with voters, uh, not just people in the audience or, uh, or um, you know, attacking somebody on stage, but how they're going to be reaching people sitting on couches just like these watching that debate. And through that means they can tell, and telling part of their story, it's their introduction to these voters, introduce themselves, make a connection. So Jane said that she believes the process will push toward the left, will push the eventual nominee toward the left. Uh, there's a CNN poll that says 57% of Democrats want the candidate with the best chance to beat Trump, and 38% of Democrats want uh, the most ideological candidate or the most progressive candidate. How's that likely to settle out? And I'll, I'll start with you, Stephanie. Well, I think the Democratic Party is uh, more liberal than it has in previous years. Uh, there's a stat, and Bob, you probably know this, the number of Democrats who identify as liberal um, now within the Democratic Party has grown significantly over the past 15 years. So I think the, the party is more liberal. I think the country on specific issues uh, is more progressive than it used to be. Like the idea of not just free college, and we can debate the idea of free college, and I'm not speaking on it as whether or not I think it's a good idea or a bad idea, but the, just the idea of free college has gained more support even over the last three, four years. Um, you know, Jane mentioned earlier that in the primary process and even in the general election, what you're really doing is running individual state campaigns because um, you're trying to win that primary in that particular state. And then in the general election, you're trying to win those electoral votes in that particular state. So uh, in, uh, in 2008 and 2012 on the Obama campaign, we thought of, about it as, you know, 23 to 26, depending upon the year, um, individual campaigns. Um, not a national campaign, but individual state-run campaigns. And that's how we, we ran our, our efforts. Um, so understanding how these issues play in those states is really critical. And I think on some issues, whether it's minimum wage or paid leave, or even the idea of um, better access to health care, whether it's universal care or Medicare for all or however you want to define it, all of those are very popular in the Democratic Party. The issue is when you start to dig in and start comparing about, well, oh, if we're going to spend all this money on individual, on health care, where's that money going to come from? That's going to come from my taxes, or that's going to take away from my school, or that means these, uh, you know, these investments can't be made in something else. That's where these candidates are going to run into some roadblocks. I think there will be a natural process. Um, as more and more is known, because uh, we all know we can we can talk about the Green New Deal as an aspiration. We can talk about Medicare for all really as a talking point, but voters have no idea exactly what that means at this point. Um, or we could talk about free community college or free college, but the details of that um, are not really explained. Once those details are laid bare, I think that this is going to sort itself out, particularly in some of these early primary states, um, into proposals that, you know, are more uh, appealing to a broader electorate. Um, 
I also think that they're, well, I'm filibustering, so. No, you're not. <laughs> I was just going to say, I do think there, there's danger for Democrats. Uh, and it, Democrats are arguing this on both sides right now about whether we should just embrace these things and not um, back off of these bold ideas. Uh, and I, I'm not suggesting backing off, but I do think we should take seriously um, this socialist meme that Donald Trump is trying to paint Democrats with. And, uh, you know, Democrats want to take away your job, your health care. Um, it's the same thing they did to Barack Obama in, um, and for policies that were not, not as progressive as what we're dealing with today. Um, we need to define these progressive, these policies early and not see, let that, them define what we're talking about. We need to explain exactly what uh, what we want to do with health care, what we want to do with the environment, what we want to do with college, um, and do it forcefully. It's more complicated with a 15-plus primary process, <laughs> candidate primary process, to do that, but there's a real danger. And I think as these candidates are running, I think Democrats should coalesce and find a way to make sure that there's a, there's a campaign in place to push back on what Trump is doing. You know, I talk with a Republican who was a high official – uh, with Trump, who is no longer there, mm -hmm. that totally protects his anonymity because that involves a very large number of people, uh, who told me that a month ago he would have said there was no way for Trump to get reelected. But now he thinks there is a way for Trump to get reelected. After Senator Kamala Harris said that she was for Medicare for all and would take away everybody's private health insurance, which she's tried to walk back. Uh, that uh, the whole idea of calling yourself a socialist uh, in the heartland of the country, he thinks, is a real problem. And he believes that, or hopes, I'm not sure where he believes it, he hopes that Democratic primary voters won't be pragmatic, that they will be ideological purists. Uh, Adam, you've been around an awful lot of these. What do you think? Uh, first of all, I agree with Jane that the party is going to get pulled to the left here. I also uh, uh, agree with your anonymous Republican person in the Trump campaign. I think that Democrats have done things <clears throat> in, excuse me, in the past month, six weeks, that have increased the chances of Trump uh, getting reelected, which is pretty remarkable. Um, I do think that Senator Harris is, um, I assume you want to say, mistake in terms of talking about abolishing private uh, uh, insurance companies was bad. I do think the talking points that were put out on the Green New Deal – was bad. I think the – I'm just talking about if you're a Democrat who would like to win back the White House. I'm not talking about the – you know, the what's right, what's you're wrong. You're talking about the talking point that said that the government should provide an income for all those unable or unwilling to work. That's right. I mean, you've made ads, right? You, you guys both have. That's a, that's, a, that's a pitch right down the middle. I mean, that's just making it so easy for Trump to go after Democratic candidates. And I think the two things that are going on here is, A, Democrats are dealing with um, – a elect electorate, Democratic electorate, that's very frustrated with what's going on, that genuinely wants change, that genuinely wants universal health care, all legitimate stuff. <clears throat> and some of them, and I would include Senator Harris in this, don't have that much experience in running for, pres running for president. And running for president is not easy. So you, and, and AOC is the same way. You make mistakes. And somebody like Trump or anyone with some experience in this knows how to seize on mistakes. So I think something you should watch really carefully if you want to see how this election is going to turn out, is how much Democrats are going to do things now that could provide ammunition for Trump in two years to use against them. And all that thing, all the things that you were just talking about are classic examples of that. Now, even though I agree, Jane, that the party will – I think the ultimate candidate – the party is getting pulled to the left, and the ultimate candidate will be more to the left than Hillary Clinton is, which I guess really isn't saying a hell of a lot um, – but I do think that you want to see whether or not a candidate will be able to do what candidates try to do, which is to pull their candidacy back to the center when he or she is running in the general election. Um, Ken Melman ran uh, um, George George W. Bush's re-election campaign in 2000. George H. W. George George, George W. Bush, Bush in 2004. Right. I and remember it too well. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, he said that where. I don't know whether he really believed this, um, but he used to say that you want to end up running in the general election. You want to run in the primary when you end up in the general election. That was his sort of theory. I don't believe Bush really did that. I don't believe he really um, 
believes that. But I think that's a pretty good strategy to work on. In this case, you're going to have you're going to have to have people, Democratic candidates, running for president, making their way through the primary, and not getting tagged with the kind of issues that Trump can crush he or she with come the general election. And one of those would be saying we're going to abolish private insurance because that's something that's not going to play well with a lot of Americans, in my view. I want to ask you a related question, Jane. Uh, Bernie Sanders recently said, we've got to look at candidates not by the color of their skin, not by their sexual orientation or their gender, and not by their race. He was pilloried by the Twitter commentariat. He was attacked by a lot of people. What kind of role will identity politics play in these primaries? Um, that's, a, that's a tough one. I, I'd like to come back to that, but before we do, can I follow uh, up Of on course this? you can. And I want to make a couple of observations about how it is that we're analyzing this. This is university, so we're going to step back for a moment and think analytically about what we're doing. Uh, there are a couple of comments uh, struck me. One, that you don't want to give Trump something that he could pounce on and use in the election. You could be wearing a blue suit, and he could pounce on that and use that in the election. So let's not for a moment think that there's a perfect candidacy, a perfect way of looking, a perfect way of speaking, because in politics, politics is obviously an opportunistic sport, and so you're going to pounce on anything. So that's my first observation. There's no such thing as a perfect candidate, and we can second-guess it all, but they're almost, almost always backward rationalizations. The second thing is the question of what even, in, you know, what are people actually learning uh, in a campaign? So Stephanie made the point that over time, candidates would teach the electorate. I, I'd like to just stop for a moment and ask ourselves is that's what, if that is what is really happening. And, and related to that, if we can teach half of the electorate, or at least the, the hard um, and fast 34, 35 percent, that Russia is actually our friend, and we were able to do that. I'm not talking about we. I'm talking that a political campaign and two years of a presidency is able to flip so dramatically that Russia is not a foe of the United States, but instead perhaps a friend along with North Korea. If we're able to do, if that is able, if that is possible, it's not only possible, it is our reality, then we have to ask ourselves um, really hard questions about the assumptions that we're bringing to this. And implicit in Bob's point was what is, I think you said, um, electable. I think we have to throw out what we thought electable was before. Electable is something different now. And I'm just going to add somebody out here. I'm a, I see a lot of political science majors. Give me a one-sentence definition of socialism. What is socialism? Okay. All right. So one more. Give me one more. Do you, do you think this is – so if you ask your grandma or your aunt, your Aunt Jean, what's socialism? Would she be able – that's a very good answer. That's a textbook answer. Um, what, and, and a good one. You are in college. Um, what do – you, do you think people recognize it? Because the notion is that socialism is evil somehow. If you provide for – if you provide for – and that's a notion. That's a Cold War notion. I'm in a uh, – say to you. I think we need to rethink that. What is electable? Is electable someone who brings ideas like the New Green Deal or the or um, Medicare for All? Maybe socialism, that word, is not such a bad word anymore. Maybe it is. Maybe it is among a certain group of people. I think that if we can observe what we have observed happening with respect to just turning on its head so many things that were considered fact, before or perceptions of what was evil and what was dangerous before is no longer. If we are able to say uh, with a straight face and debate, is there really climate change, the scientific question of that, then we're in a, a, a very different circumstance. Therefore, uh, the notion of electability needs to be processed in a different way. I don't think there is that electability by definition means coming to the center. I think that that analyzing it in that way only hems us in to not see the future. I think we need to see what it is that people understand as the issues that are good for them. And if they line up with socialism, call it what you want. But if those line up with what they want, then just give it a different name. How, how do you guys react to that? Uh, a couple of points. Well, I think you raise a really interesting question, which is whether or not socialism um, 
it, 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 whether Donald Trump is sort of like stuck in father's no, father knows best idea, so whether Americans are still afraid of socialism, whether it's still a boogie word or not, I think it probably is. And I'm gonna I'm gonna talk from a more pragmatic, how do you win an election point of view as opposed to um, what would be best point of view. And that is that I do think the, the, I get your point about the blue suit. Trump will go after that, but I also think that you don't want to give things to him that he'll be able to use very effectively. Like, you can't do anything if you have small hands and Trump's going to go after you for having small hands. I mean, who cares? But there are certain issues that have proven to have resonance in American politics over the years. Socialism in the past had. You could be right. That might be fading. But I think you've got to be careful not to give, if you want to win, not to give him issues um, that he can use to pound you with. And I'm not saying step away from what you believe in. For example, I don't know whether Kamala Harris believes or not in getting rid of private insurance. If she does, great. Argue it. If one of the candidates, if Bernie, if Bernie Sanders believes in socialism, great, argue it. But I'm saying don't kind of slip into these things without being aware of the fact that they're going to be used against you. And maybe in an I ideal world, they shouldn't be effective. But I believe that in the world that we're in now, I still think that that kind of stuff is going to be damaging in the kind of states where Democrats lost narrowly in 2016. Stephanie? I agree with both of you. <laughs> <laughs> No, look, I, I said that the Democratic Party is more liberal than uh, really it ever has been today. And that's a, a result of the financial crisis. That's a result in the response to the financial crisis. It's a re in response to Donald Trump getting elected. It, a lot of things have played into where we are today. That being said, socialism has really never been a dirty word in the Democratic primary process. I mean, a lot of people, you know, Barack Obama was called a socialist by Republicans since the day he entered the presidential race in 2007. And if you notice, there wasn't a lot of pushback uh, in early primaries because that's early uh, primary voters don't care about that. They care about the policies that come behind that. So what I was trying to say about how this process will evolve and, and Jane, I think we're sort of saying the same thing, that like, we don't know what, what life is going to be like a year from now in this presidential election, because between now and then, it's like, it's like cat lives. It, it, we, we, the world would be completely different in terms of where we are politically. Uh, or what, what happens in this race that shakes it up. We, we cannot predict that. But we know that there are some fundamentals. The policies that we're, they're, these candidates are talking about, um, at a 30,000 foot level are very popular in the democratic base. Once you start to examine them, and it's not gonna be candidates that are gonna be teaching um, these voters, but these voters are going to educate themselves. They're gonna look at what this policy means. And if, it, if, one of, if somebody in, let's say in the Wisconsin primary realizes that they're gonna lose their insurance because of one of these candidates' Medicare for all plans, that could be a different reaction than somebody in California in the primary process learning that very same thing. So this is gonna be a natural sorting of these issues um, through the primary process. I do think that Adam is also right that, look, I can, we can give you a million war stories up here of uh, whether being on the, the incumbent side of the presidency running for your reelection re versus the candidate uh, side, the challenger side, in uh, running against the, the president and what happens in primary process, processes. Trump is looking at everything that's being said um, in the Democratic primary process and, and the apparatus around him. And they will use that, and, and granted, anything, they could use anything. So you can't, um, you can't run your campaign that way, but you should also not make unforced errors. Saying that you want to eliminate private insurance, I think is an unforced error for a general election. And I've been through the Affordable Care Act, I've been on every health care battle since 1993, and eliminating private insurance in a president, uh, promising to eliminate private insurance in a presidential campaign is problematic in a general election. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn this over to the audience earlier than I usually do, because there are a lot of you here, and I think there's a lot of interest, but I want to get uh, the answer to two quick questions. I'm going to go back to this question about identity politics. What role is that going to play? The fact that a candidate is a woman, the fact the candidate is a minority, the fact the candidate is old. The fact the candidate is a man, and the fact that the candidate is white. That's identity politics, too. 
we played identity politics, at least with respect to Trump and even within the context of Sanders, as the default category. It has now become revealed. So whiteness and maleness has always been the standard by which we have come to see who is a legitimate political candidate, who is a leader, who is the person who should be the chief executive. And upon eight, after eight years of not having a white man in the office, identity politics is ex exactly what Donald Trump has played for the last four years, two years in office and two years prior to that. So I don't will think that happen on the other side with Democrats? Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's any way of avoiding it, and denying it is probably not the best strategy either, because for whether you're, you know, quote, unquote, the old-fashioned white working class, or if you're a democratic socialist, lesbian, transgender, um, you know, fluid person, it doesn't matter. It's still identity politics. It's not a dirty word, but it's also not something that can be avoided. I'm not sure it's a bad Yeah, I agree with you. I'm not sure it's a bad thing at all. I mean, I, I covered uh, Obama in 2008. And there was a real excitement about the fact that we were about to elect an African-American as president. And I think that one of the things that Kamala Harris has going for her and some of the other women candidates is the, the prospect of first woman, first whatever. I mean, I think that's an important factor in American politics. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, I get the argument against identity politics. I just don't think it's a bad thing. Do you have anything to add? I have one other quick question, then I'm going to turn this over to the audience. I, the only thing I would add is Bernie is obviously <laughs> saying that for a reason, <laughs> because he's a white man, an older white man, uh, and he thinks that it, it does matter. And, you know, I think that when – I think there are social norms that have guided the presidential process for as long as we've been a country in finding – in look, voters looking at white men as the people that can – you know, be the commander in chief. I think we've challenged that over the years. Uh, I think Hillary running for president challenged that. Uh, Barack Obama uh, uh, being president for eight years challenged that. And slowly, you know, th things are changing. This year is a is a, you know a, a watershed year in terms of what the Democratic race looks like. Um, and. I don't think we know what's going to happen um, in terms of how identity politics of how a voter views what their president should look like. That's what identity politics in a presidential race means and whether it, you have a positive reaction or a negative reaction based on somebody's uh, racial makeup or gender. And I don't think we know yet. We've been testing this every four years for a long time and we've never had a, a race that looks like this one. Uh, I want to turn this over to questions, but first, and you can each briefly react if you want. There's so much focus on this race already, and it occurs to me that if you had done this in other years, uh, if you'd done this in 2008, Obama would have looked like he was faltering at this point, and Clinton was strengthening. If you'd done this in 2004, you would have thought that Howard Dean was going to be the Democratic nominee for president. Uh, and that Kerry was basically through when, in fact, he won both Iowa and New Hampshire and then almost every other primary and caucus. So are we too early to be making these assessments to say, gee, Bernie Sanders raised $30 million or whatever it was. Uh, uh, Amy Klobuchar had a great announcement. How much does all that matter at this point? The money obviously matters long term, but how much, if you had a great announcement, does it matter? It might. My view on this stuff in general is don't, as a political reporter, is don't be predictive. All these people, there's so much pressure on you to be predictive and say who's going to win and who's up and who's down. Don't do it. I don't think it matters at all. Your, your argument about Dean, you know, I remember there was this big covering Dean and Trump and there was this big sort of flow of stories in, in like December before the primaries that Dean was pulling ahead. And I remember thinking at that, at that point it was ridiculous. And of course it was ridiculous. And on the other side of it, I, I thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win the nomination in 2008. I was wrong. And so don't make predictions like that. I don't think the stuff that we're seeing now really matters. I mean, I should, that's overstating it. I'm sorry. I don't think you can use it to predict who the nominee is going to be. You can sort of get indications of what strengths and weaknesses are. But I think my advice to you as viewers, if you're reporters, I say the same thing, political consultants, is just sort of watch and take it all in and let the process play itself out. I'm not sure that answers your question, but that's my view. I think this is like um, the, the beginning of the semester and you're looking at your class and you're thinking who's going to be the best student in here who's going to be the student that you know 
consistently is, is going to be the star of the class. I mean, all of you are. But, but you know that, there's going, that there, are, there is variation. Or it's like, you know, you go to the soccer field when your kid's eight years old and someone picks out who the future stars and, you know, three, three years later he's, you know, smoking weed and behind the, the elementary school. So the point is there, are, there is variation. And, yes, some of this is, it is too early to tell. But with respect to this, we're not talking about college kids and we're not talking about eight-year-old soccer players. We're talking about presidential candidates. And in this circumstance, I think that it matters. I do think that every observation we have matters. And what, why it matters is that you don't find candidates who are making unforced errors, that you find consistent and disciplined candidates who are knowledgeable and who are strategic. If you find that, then that's a possibility of a winner. If you find a candidate making a lot of unforced errors and who is playing defense all the time and has no plan for offense, and I think you can, you can provide each one of these as a data point that provides you some sense of the likelihood of that candidate succeeding. I promise to turn this over to audience questions earlier than we usually do, so just put your hand up. Somebody will bring you a microphone. Hey, guys. My name is Neil, and my question is, um, <clears throat> in uh, presidential races, how important is name recognition, especially uh, considering, like, some maybe, like, a small state governor, say, like, Steve Bullock or something like that, um, how that plays out versus someone like Bernie Sanders or Kamala Harris who already has, uh, I guess, that kind of advantage? At this stage in the race, um, if somebody doesn't have name recognition, it's hard for them to raise money. Um, it's hard for them to get booked on TV. It's hard for them to recruit talent um, in some of these early primary states. So it's, it's just much more difficult. If you have name recognition, a Bernie Sanders or... Uh, Joe Biden, um, you know, the reason you see them at the top of the polls is because they're, they're more defined than these other people, which means people will be more comfortable supporting them, giving them money, going to work for their campaigns, volunteering. Um, so it matters. And uh, I think that, um, you know, I do think we're going to see a lot of these governors, Hickenlooper, Bullock, um, I think Jay Inslee, are all going to get in this race. It'll be interesting to see how they go about raising money um, because they don't have, you know, I guess uh, some do for people who are involved in the um, uh, DGA, the Democratic Governors Association and things like that, but they don't have uh, national networks to raise money um, or big online presences to reach people to raise low dollars. Um, so it's, it's a hurdle. It's not insurmountable. It's been done. Um, you know, Bill Clinton <laughs> did it in 92, but that's a long time ago, pre-internet uh, fundraising. Um, but it's a, it's a challenge for them. Either of you have a take on this? Uh, the one thing I would add, I, um, I was about to say that name recognition is something that you can eventually buy. Uh, but the other thing I would add here to what Stephanie was saying is that we're in a new world now. So I think there's a lot of ways for candidates to get attention and to become famous. Um, because the internet, Twitter. So I think it's hard. I don't think it's as much of a disadvantage as I would have said um, four or eight years ago. I mean, I think it's still probably, you'd rather have it than not. But I don't, you know, at this point, I think it's really possible that some candidate whose name we don't necessarily know here will end up being the nominee in, uh, in uh, 18 months, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely true. It's not insurmountable. I mean, look at Beto O'Rourke um, in the last cycle. He was an unknown House candidate that nobody had ever heard of. And he became the national phenom. Uh, and he has 860,000 people on his Internet list. Wow. Second only to Bernie Sanders. Right. Um, so there are ways to get around it. You never know. Like I said earlier, you never know when that match is going to light something. And so I think a lot, of, a lot of people, Bullock and others, are thinking, well, why not me? You know, um, Bullock especially, he's got a great record uh, as governor of Montana. Uh, he's a real reform-minded Democrat, um, one of the original populist progressives, yet uh, reform-oriented to fit his state. You know, I think there's nobody else that occupies that space in the race, so why not him? And you, you just never know when that, you know, we, we called it lightning in the bottle <laughs> for Barack Obama, but you never know when that that match is going to get lit. 
another question? Over there, here, back there. Um, oh, whoops. If you guys were running a individual's campaign right now for the Democrats, um, what state would you like see as the biggest focal point for the early primaries and caucuses? Well, I'm, I'm, I'll take a crack at this because I have some experience. Look, there's been this whole idea that because California moved up, Iowa and New Hampshire are less important. I strongly disagree with that. Uh, I, the ballots, the mail-in ballots in California will go out, will start arriving the night of the Iowa caucuses. And I don't think California Democrats, who are notoriously slow in returning those mail-in ballots, are all going to rush to return them the next day. I think they're going to watch what happens in Iowa. They're going to watch what happens in New Hampshire. They're going to watch what happens in South Carolina. And I think the field is going to be winnowed. And at that point, uh, the the... California voters, and California occurs on a Super Tuesday, California voters and voters in other states will be looking at people that they think have a viable chance to win. Uh, I would say you have to focus on Iowa. You can't skip Iowa. You can't skip New Hampshire. Strategy has been tried. Ask President Giuliani how well it worked out. It just doesn't work, and people are going to pay, be paying a lot of attention to it. Does Bernie Sanders maybe have a natural advantage in New Hampshire? Probably. Will he split some of his vote with Elizabeth Warren? Yes. I think I was probably pretty wide open. So I'd begin with those early primaries, and I don't think you can afford to skip any of them. I think you've got to go to all of them. Do you think, guys, a follow up question? Do you think that Kamala Harris is going to put California off the map for the Democratic primary? Or will Democrats decide not to? Absolutely not. Okay. For two reasons. One, if people are doing well coming out of those first three primaries, if they're winnowed in, to the top three or four, of course they're going to compete in California. Two, and we've talked about this before, I think, because Democratic delegates are allocated by proportional representation, and California is going to have the largest number of delegates of any state by a huge factor, people are going to come here. If they lose and only get 25% of the vote, they're going to get 25% of the delegates. It's worth a huge a huge amount. So no, I don't think California is going to be off the map at all. I think California will be important. I just don't think it destroys the importance of the early primaries. Another question? Hey, uh, my name is Josh Barrick. Uh, thanks for uh, this talk. I've really enjoyed listening to it. Um, a lot of it, it's been about uh, the shift to the left by the Democrats. Um, and I was wondering if, uh, I mean, someone on this panel mentioned that they think it was uh, partially caused by the financial crisis, but uh, that was like 10 years ago. So I was wondering if you think it was caused, it's been caused by rational reasons, or if it's maybe an irrational cognitive dissonance by uh, kind of Clinton-style Clinton uh, triangulation by Trump, where now Democrats can't, uh, they can't talk about things like infrastructure spending, or they can't talk about bringing drug prices down, or protecting workers from cheap labor in China and Mexico, and now they have to talk about things like mo modern monetary theory or uh, the Green New Deal? Um, or if, if, it's, and if it's a, there's a rational causes, could that cause problems then in the, gen in the, in the general election? Um, and if, and if, it's real, I mean it's, if it's real causes, then what are those real causes? Because I think it's worth exploring. It's a very good question, Josh. Um, I don't know that the distinction is necessarily rational versus irrational. It depends on where you're located. Um, the financial crisis hit poor people in a very different way than it did wealthy people, um, and the very wealthiest. So there isn't one thing to it. I would encourage us to think about this problem, or rather this question, um, not just in the United States, because you see exactly the same phenomenon happening elsewhere, uh, the, the Brexit example, and also the the rise of authoritarian far right as well as far left is not just something that's happening in the United States. And so it's a global phenomenon, I would suggest to you, that is a function not only of globalization and migration more generally, but structural changes in all kinds of economies to service economies and the movement of global capital and and in manufacturing to certain locations leaving service elsewhere. So the, the, um, the West in the, not just the United States, but the West is 
across the globe facing very similar elements. You're gonna, you see labor going much further to the left than it has before in England, or Great Britain, and then the Conservative Party going in a different direction as well. I think that what we're in now is, um, in the United States, a true uh, party realignment. We just can't feel it. We, we can feel it, but we don't see it because it's changing right in front of us. The difference between you and your freshman picture and your senior year, you think you look the same. You do not. But you don't notice it because you're looking at it every day. We're in the middle of a realignment, and because we are, I think it's difficult to frame the question as only um, irrational versus rational, but instead it's a global phenomenon that's being driven by structural um, foundational issues in economic development. Uh, next question. Let's get a mic to people. And he's been trying hard for a long time, so we should catch up oh. with him, too. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Mine will be quick, hopefully. How do you think candidates or young people themselves can stay engaged um, during this process, this election, um, before getting apathetic or fatigued? Trump. Seriously, that's it. I mean, to, to, to add one thing to that, I think, I think you're going to see young people getting very involved in this campaign. 2018, as Jane said, their turnout was much higher than it's been in the past. I think their turnout's going to be pretty high in 2020. I think it's going to be pretty high in the primaries. Next question. Hello, my name's, <clears throat> my name's Ken Glenn. I'm from L.A. County. I don't go to school here. But uh, I want to bring up something real quick. It's more of a comment and a question at the end that Stephanie was talking about. I worked all eight of the campaigns uh, when we took over Orange County and turned it blue. Okay, first of all, I want to comment that 90% of the people we worked with were all this age here. We were blown apart, okay? So I got a lot of hope there. But I was a delegate for the Obama campaign for 2012, and I worked on the Hillary campaign. And I supported her all the way, but I want to bring up something I think he was mentioning. They're trying to, and you brought up also, of, uh, you know, basically saying we're socialist and all that. They are already on the radio. If you listen to Scum Hannity and the rest of those guys there, excuse me, I'm sorry, but uh, they're already trying to define us that way. And it was kind of funny. I was working on Har Harley Ruda's campaign, and they asked everybody in the room, how many people think that Social Security was an entitlement? You would be shocked. They thought, and that's what they're doing. They're saying we're getting get all these giveaways and the Democrats are spending all this money when a lot of hard-earned people for years and decades have been paying Social Security. So I just wanted to bring up two things is that the Democrats, you know, I tried to holler to the Hillary's campaign. I was doing uh, phone banking and I was a captain in Long Beach. And we'd call other states and I started telling them, hey, there's a lot of resentment and they don't like her and all that. And, and uh, people would comment to me on the phone when I talked to them, she's too damn good to come and see us. She don't get my damn vote. When I worked on the Obama campaign, they actually had somebody come out here and talk to us. They sat down and talked to us. We did not get one email so, or call back. It's, it's great comment. What's your question? Okay, the question basically was, uh, can you get somebody to comment on that or I'll pass the thing to whoever the leaders of the uh, party, uh, at the, whoever wins the campaign at the time, to get the message out. You know, they need to mm -hmm. listen to the people this mm -hmm. time. Last time they didn't listen to us. And, I uh, totally agree. And one last thing is, on the thing, find out how many people in the Democratic Party think that Social Security is an entitlement. It's not. I paid for the damn thing, and a lot of other people did. But right now the Republicans are doing that. They're branding us as socialists, and it's not a bad well, word. Well, I would say, by the way, the best thing that could ever happen to the Democratic Party uh, in 2020 is if uh, Donald Trump, and he won't do this, he understands this, if Donald Trump launched an attack on Social Security, that would be absolutely devastating. Uh, another question. Uh, thank you, and thank you for this great panel. Is there a contradiction between a party that is increasingly progressive and moving leftward and a primary voting population that definitely is, and a general election that, as always, will come down to Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. I mean, so I think that's a classic sort of tension of running a presidential campaign in this country. And I don't think it's only a Democratic problem. Um, but I do think, as James, you were saying, there is some alignment going on. And I'm not sure a realignment going on. 
and I'm not sure that Florida, Ohio are going to be the kind of pivotal states that they once were. I don't know. But I think that's something you need to keep a, a, an open mind about. Um, I do think a Democratic candidate running now needs to think about being competitive in whatever states he or she thinks will be the kind of swing states in um, 2020 as they campaign through the primaries now. And it might be – I mean, I don't think it's going to be Ohio or Florida, but it might be certainly Michigan or Wisconsin or it might be Arizona. Arizona is going to be the new Colorado, I, I think. I think that's right. I don't think it's going to be Texas yet, but there are probably people in this room who disagree with me. So um, – I think that's something people need to think about, but I don't think it's the same kind of problem that it was, say, with Kerry or with uh, Hillary Clinton or Obama. Another question? Hi, my name's Lucas. Um, I just want to get your guys' opinions on Bernie Sanders' chance this time around. <laughs> Stephanie, you want to start? <laughs> um. Well, he came out of the box very strong. Um, I, I don't think we know. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's going to be a stronger candidate. He's going to have a better run campaign because he's been through this once. Um, and he, you know, occupies a particular space in this uh, party. Um, I guess the, the things that I would think about, and I, I answered the question is, I don't know how strong he's going to be, but the things that I would think about is that he's not the only candidate in the race that's for Medicare for All now. He's not the only candidate in the race that wants to do something about college, whether it's free college or community college, whatever you want to define it. Um, the, the country has continued to grow more diverse. Um, the electorate is, is younger. Um, the, you know, it is hard to... Uh, to be a passion candidate twice. Um, so I would think about all those things. But I will also say things are so unpredictable, and we have, uh, you know, between now and when the first votes are cast, uh, a little under a year from now, it, it, things are, this is, this is dynamic. This is going to change a lot. Uh, Bernie's going to be up, Bernie's going to be down. Um, and we don't, we don't know how this is going to flesh out yet. Um, the other thing that I would think about is, you know, Bob had mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, what do Democratic primary voters care most about? Do they care about ideological purity or do they care about beating Trump? And then the question is, do you think somebody like Bernie could beat Trump? And we might all have different answers um, about whether that's possible, but uh, if that is the, the first thing um, on Democratic primary voters' minds, then you have to look at Bernie compared to everybody else that's running. Can I add two points to that? One is um, Sanders was like the new cool thing back in 2016, and he's not the new cool thing. I and mean, there's lots of new, new cool things that he has to compete with. So he's lost that sort of edge. The other thing is, um, and I don't mean to sound like a Clinton campaign person here, there's legitimate criticism that Sanders didn't come under the kind of scrutiny that he might have back in 2016 because us, meaning media, didn't really take him that seriously. Or maybe that he was such a cool story that we didn't sort of like do the kind of scrutiny that I think that maybe we should have done. And you've seen some of that already on some of the gender stuff, some of that Me Too stuff that was going on in his campaign. So my guess is that he's going to face some tougher press coverage this time around. So I would factor that in as well. But again, with Stephanie's sort of um, caveat that who the heck knows, right? Who knows? Jane, do you have anything to add? Uh, then I'm going to start off by thanking Jane, thanking Adam, uh, thanking Stephanie. Uh, they're, they're, all, they're all good friends, and I'm very grateful to them for being here. And thank all of you. Those are really interesting questions. Uh, really enjoyed having you, and see you on March 19th uh, with Joe Kennedy. Take care. Thanks.